existed in Medina between the people of the book and the Muslims. And there were various regulations that were being sent down as to how to approach the discussion and when they bring about their points through the Torah or the Injil, through the previous scriptures, how to respond to these specific objections that were being raised. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuing on this theme and today we're looking at uh, the verse 92 and I will translate and then speak about the relevant topics that are related to the verse. The verse points out لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ None of you can attain piety until you spend from that which is beloved to you. وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ شَيْءٍ And whatever you spend فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِهِ عَلِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is well aware of that. So this is a verse of the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about infaq and spending for his cause. Now the disbelievers, specifically the munafiqun, the hypocrites, and some of the people of the book, there were commands in the, in the Torah, in the Injil, and for the hypocrites and for the mushrikun, they knew this was a good trait to spend, to help the poor, to help the needy. And this is why even before Islam, the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, was doing this when Khadija radiallahu anha pointed out to the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, when the Prophet ﷺ received the revelation for the very first time, and he was disturbed and he didn't know what was happening. He came home and he felt that there might be some danger his way. So Khadija radiallahu anha responded to the Prophet ﷺ that there's nothing to fear because this can never be an evil spirit or a demon or a jinn that has come unto you. The reason being is you're a man of good character. You're a man of purity. You're a man who spends on the needy. You're the man who, who helps the orphans. You're the man who supports justice. So devils, jinn and evil spirits etc. These can only come upon people who are evil. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a mention in the Qur'an That those who strive to do good For them will be the return of good So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Is speaking about the fact that when the call is made The Prophet peace and blessings upon him was making the call Many occasions there's a difference of opinion Some ulama say that this verse refers to mandatory spending Such as zakat such as at the end of Ramadan, there is zakatul fitr, sadqatul fitr. There are occasions where we must spend. For example, a person has the necessary amount to proceed for hajj and return, then it becomes fard upon them to spend their money and to go for the uh, fulfillment of hajj. So when the Prophet ﷺ made the call of proceeding for hajj or giving zakat and mandatory spending, then all the sahaba, they came forward and they responded. They followed what was the command. So the hypocrites began mocking. Some of the Ahlul Kitab, the Jews and the Christians, they also said things like, you know, how crazy are these people? They're giving half of their income for the sake of Allah, for the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him's cause. These people are foolish. These people are not in their minds. So Allah revealed this verse, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You can never attain piety until you spend from what is most, most beloved to you. And whatever you spend, وَمَا أَنْفَقْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Whatever you spend, وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ شَيْءٍ Whatever you spend, here شَيْءٍ means any small amount. Allah is well aware of that. And if Allah is well aware of that, He is able to give you the return. And He knows with what intention you are spending. He knows for what cause you are spending. So the idea here is that it's not the sacrifice of spending, it's for what reason that you are spending. It's for what reason you are spending. And notice how the word that is being used here is hub. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about ma tuhibboon, what you love. So why would a person make sacrifice? Many disbelievers even ask nowadays. You know, I tell them that the approximate price for going for Hajj nowadays is seven to eight thousand dollars, average person. So they spend you spend eight thousand dollars just to go there and go around the structure. You spend eight thousand dollars to do that. I said that's not the purpose. 
It's the love of Allah. It's what God has commanded. So when a person has love for something, they're ready to sacrifice for that. And there are so many examples, some of the famous stories that when this verse came down, some of the things that happened, one of the famous stories is about Abu Talha. Abu Talha radiallahu an had an orchard right behind the masjid. And the Prophet sallallahu on the way to the masjid or sometimes returning back home or returning away from the masjid, he would go into the garden of Abu Talha, he would sit in the shade and he would have some dates and drink the fresh water. So when this verse came down, he came to the Prophet peace and blessings upon him and he said, the verse is saying that you cannot attain piety until you spend from what is most beloved to you. This orchard is most beloved to me. So I want to give it in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet peace and blessings upon him congratulated him and he told him to spend it on his aqrabin, on his relatives who are poor. There's another incident regarding Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu an. When this verse came down, Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu an, he had a horse that he had spent so much money on. And this verse came down and he told the Prophet sallallahu the most beloved commodity I have is this horse. And I intend to give it in the path of Allah. And he gave it in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again the Prophet sallallahu uh, congratulated him. And there's another incident that is mentioned in regards to Ibn Umar radiallahu an. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he purchased some workers. At that time slavery was very common. And as soon as he purchased the workers, he set them free. And someone asked him that usually when people hire workers and purchase workers, they take work from them and then if they feel they would like to set them free, they do. Here you just purchased them, you didn't take any service from them and you're setting them free. So he said, this verse came down, That you can never attain piety until you uh, give from what is most beloved to you. And I saw these are some of the commodities that are so beloved to me. So I'm giving in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, what we learn from here is the believer will look at the concept. And the concept is the love of Allah. We want to attain piety. We want to attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whether people mock at us or not, we will spend for Allah's cause. We will make sacrifice for Allah's cause. And this is because the objective, we are attaining the objective. And we're not fools that we would spend without a motive, without a purpose. There is a purpose and there is return. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that مَا نَقَصَتْ مَالٌ مِّن صَدَقَةً Your wealth is not decreased through charity. In fact, it increases. So again, the, the purpose of this verse is that uh, the purpose and the motive that the Sahaba uh, would spend was to attain the piety and the people who were not, not believing and specifically some of the hypocrites who had made some mockery there is a famous story about the Prophet peace and blessings upon him asking for charity and some of the companions they came with heaps so much commodities and there were some who only came with dates a, a date or two dates and the munafiqun the hypocrites they made remarks on both parties they said look at those who are coming with large amounts they're doing this to show off. And the ones who came with a little amount, just a date or two, they said, Allah doesn't need one date. Allah doesn't need two dates. So Allah revealed the verses of the Qur'an that they are spending with ikhlas, with sincerity. So both the large amounts and even the minute amount that you think is insignificant, it's bringing so much reward for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting that. Inna Allah shakurun haleem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is grateful. Even the little actions we do for His sake, they multiply in tremendous rewards. So, continuing on this theme, <clears throat> one of the objections that were raised, and here I'm looking at verse number 3, ver 93, 94, and 95, before we get into the translation of these verses. The, 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 some of the Jewish community in Medina, what they did is that they didn't believe in naskh. Naskh is a concept that the Quran speaks about. مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا Whenever any verse comes down, any command comes down, sometimes Allah brings another command to abrogate the previous command. Just to give a simple example, the first Qibla was towards Bayt al-Maqdis, towards Jerusalem. After 17 months, 
the command came down that you no longer face Baytul Maqdis, you turn to the Baytullah. So the, some of the Jewish community, and they were learned people, they were educated people of the Torah. They came and they said, all of a sudden the command changes, until now you're praying towards Jerusalem, Baytul Maqdis, and now you're praying towards the Baytullah, you're praying towards Mecca and the Kaaba. So the Prophet ﷺ responded, the, the, the command came down and nasq took place, abrogation took place. And they said, what, what is abrogation? What is abrogation? There's no concept of abrogation. Subhanallah, the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, then responded. And this is a sign, this is proof that the Prophet ﷺ was a messenger of Allah. He said, you're denying abrogation. Abrogation is in your own books. Abrogation is mentioned in the Torah. It's mentioned in the Injil. And the Prophet ﷺ, he asked them, bring your books. Bring the Torah, bring the Injil. And I will show you where it's mentioned, Nasq is mentioned in your own books. And one of the examples the Prophet ﷺ gave to them was through this, this verse that we are going to translate right now. That Yaqub والسلام, everything was made halal for him. The Banu Israel, many commands came, but they came in gradual stages. And Yaqub for him, it was permissible to eat uh, camel meat as well as drink the camel milk. Like the Prophet ﷺ, he also ate camel meat and he also drank from the milk of the camel. So the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, said from the time of Ibrahim ﷺ, from the time of Yaqub ﷺ and all the previous Prophets, there was never a stage where camel meat or camel milk was made forbidden. There was one stage when Yaqub ﷺ, he got sick. One time he got sick and he made dua to Allah. He made a vow to Allah that, Oh Allah, if you give me cure, if you give me shifa, then I will do some sacrifice for you. And one of my sacrifices, I love camel meat, I love camel milk. So I will abstain from camel meat and camel milk. And this was a vow. And at that time, in that sharia, this was permissible. You could make a vow and then it becomes forbidden upon you. So he made this vow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved this action of Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, okay, now this thing is forbidden for you and also your followers. So the Jewish community in Medina, they were not eating camel meat. They were not eating, the, they were not drinking the camel milk. And the Prophet ﷺ was eating camel milk. He was eating the camel meat. He was drinking the camel milk. So the Prophet ﷺ said, you disagree with Nasr? He pointed out to them, look in the Torah on this page. It is clearly mentioned that everything was made halal for Yaqub. But then Yaqub ﷺ, he made the camel milk and camel meat forbidden upon himself. And Allah made a Nasr. Allah did the abrogation and changed the command. Just like in our sharia, in the salah at the first occasion, it was permissible to speak. But then later on it was changed that you no longer can speak in salah. Like this, there were many commands. At the initial stages, it was commanded to wash the uh, najas seven times. When a dog puts its mouth into a uh, bowl, wash it seven times. Then the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, he saw that the people understood the ruling of tahara and, and cleanliness. And then he said, you know, as long as you're satisfied, whether you wash it once or three times, if you're satisfied it's clean, that's sufficient. Yakfi, it's sufficient. So the command changed. It was verse seven times and then the Prophet ﷺ said three times, one time is sufficient. So the Prophet ﷺ pointed out in their own book that this is, in the, this is the place where you will see that Yaqub because of his, of his vow, Allah brought about abrogation and nasq. And when they saw that in their own book, they were embarrassed. And this was a sign that the Prophet, because number one, the Prophet didn't know how to read or write. Nabiyyul Ummi. Allah kept him unlettered. So it was a miracle that Allah showed him where it is in the Torah, where it is in the Injil, that nasq also existed in previous sharias. Right? The fundamentals always stay the same. Tawheed, Risala, Prophethood, Oneness of Allah, Belief in the Akhirah. This every Prophet says and claims and, and propagates. The Sharia, minor changes happen here and there. 
So part of these minor changes is the nasq comes, the abrogation comes. Right? So through these verses, Allah made it very clear that the people who had the truth, they were hiding the truth. They had the injunctions, they had the Torah, they had the Injil. The message of the Prophet ﷺ was also in their books. But they concealed it, they hid it. So through these verses, Allah is proving prophethood. Allah is proving that they're manipulating the truth. They're fooling around with the truth. And they're not giving the true facts. And this made it clear that they're the ones that are deceiving and the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is steadfast on the truth. So keeping this story in mind, we'll translate the verses and we'll look at some of the lessons we can learn from here. So this is verse number 93. All kinds of foods were permissible for the Banu Israel, for the children of Israel. Israel, I've mentioned before, means Abdullah in the language of the Jews. Abdullah in Arabic means servant of God. Isra means servant and Il means Allah in their language. Isra means Abd, servant. And Il means Allah, Israel, meaning servant of God, slave of God. So this was a title for who? For Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. His name was Israel, meaning Abdullah. So Allah is saying all the types of foods kana hillan. It was permissible. For who? For the children of Israel. Who are the children of Israel? Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam's children. إِلَّا مَا حَرَّمَ إِسْرَائِيلُ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ Except for the foods that Israel himself, meaning Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam himself, that he forbade upon himself. مِنْ قَبْلِ أَن تُنَزَّلَ التَّوْرَةِ Before the coming of the Torah. Because when the Torah came, the command was very clear. قُلْ فَأْتُوا بِالتَّوْرَاتِ فَتْلُوهَا إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ So now Allah is telling the Prophet ﷺ to tell the Jewish community who are disagreeing with Nasr, فَأْتُوا بِالتَّوْرَةِ Bring your Torah, bring your book. فَتْلُوهَا And recite it. Read it. You'll find the injunction there. إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ If you are truthful. Now the commentators, Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi, he says that some of the groups, they were so embarrassed because they knew that this was in their books, but they didn't want to bring it forward. And there was another group who actually brought it forward. And the Prophet ﷺ pointed it out to them. That look at this page, you'll see the injunction is right there. So this again is a sign of the Prophet ﷺ being on the truth. So, فَأْتُوا Torah, Bring your Torah, فَتْلُوهَا إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And recite it if you are truthful. فَمَنِ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبٌ Whosoever fabricates a lie against Allah, مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ After the truth has been made clear, فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ They are the wrongdoers. So these people, they were saying, don't believe in the Prophet, don't believe in the Messenger Muhammad Wasallam. don't accept the, the revelation of the Qur'an. We have the truth. So Allah is saying that once the matter has been made clear, you know who's on the truth and who's on falsehood, then you have to accept the truth. But what did most of them do? Despite this evidence coming forward, they didn't want to believe. They continued on their wrong path. They were insisting on staying away from the truth. So Allah says, فَمَنِ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ Whoever fabricates a lie against Allah. Because when you're talking about religion, you're, ta you're not talking about your personal matters. You're not talking about your own family. You're talking about the laws of Allah. So whoever makes a lie against Allah, that's the worst lie. فَمَنِ افْتَرَى مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ Whoever makes a lie, whoever fabricates a lie against Allah, after the truth has become clear, then they are the wrongdoers. They are on the wrong path, we don't accept that. And then finally verse 95, Allah says, قُلْ صَدَقَ اللَّهِ Say, O Prophet of Allah, Allah has spoken the truth. Allah has spoken the truth. There is nasq. There is abrogation. And Yaqub did change a command and Allah accepted that. And Allah made that as a command for all the followers of Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. فَاتَّبِعُوا مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا So don't say that you're following Yaqub and you're not going to follow Ibrahim because all the prophets, they follow the truth. I've mentioned this before. Truth supports the truth. If you study the life of Ibrahim, you'll be guided to Muhammad wasallam. If you study the life of Isa, Jesus wasallam, you'll be guided to Muhammad wasallam. If you study the life of Yaqub wasallam, you will be guided to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. If you study the authentic uh, teachings of the Torah and the Injil, 
you will find Islam as the truth. You will find the Quran as the truth. Truth supports the truth. What do they say? When you lie once, you have to lie ten times to make that one lie seem correct. So opposite is also the same. That when you speak the truth, then everything else will support the truth. Everything else will support the truth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul sadaqallah. Say, O Prophet of Allah, that Allah has spoken the truth. Both in the Torah as well as in the Quran. فَاتَّبِعُوا مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا So follow the methodology of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam who was Hanifan. He focused on Allah. He worshipped one Allah. وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And he was not amongst those who associated partners with Allah. He was not amongst those who worshipped more than one God. So these people, again, they were fooling around with the truth. They were hiding the truth and they were trying to bring about arguments to try and cause an obstacle from the Prophet peace and blessings upon him's message. So Allah through these verses made several points. One point is that the Prophet ﷺ is a true messenger. Otherwise, where would he get this information from? He didn't even know how to read their books. So this is, this is dalil, this is evidence that he is a messenger of Allah. And the other message is that we don't fool around with the truth. Once we see the truth, once we see justice, we accept the justice and we keep it on our side. So some of the lessons that we can derive from here is that we always uh, support the truth, we never hide the truth. The reason for their misguidance is they were hiding the truth, they were hiding reality. Right? The other thing is, before we speak, we should have knowledge. Before we give a verdict, before we make a decision, we should first have some sort of background and some knowledge. Many of these people, what they did, is they just made the claim there was no naskh, there's no abrogation. And it became their embarrassment when the Prophet ﷺ said, it's in your own books, go look at it. So many times we are asked questions, we are asked things, and we don't know what the real answer is, we don't know what the evidence is, and we just, you know, shoot in the air as they say. We just talk without evidence, without proof, without the substantiated information. And many times this can lead to further misguidance. It can lead to further disputes. But sometimes it's just a rumor that people spread around. Right? One, one person to another to another. And we're talking about a person, the person didn't even do that. You ask the person and he said, no, I didn't even mention that. It's totally wrong. So sometimes we speak without evidence. We just latch on to rumors or, or things that people are saying without proper proof and evidence. So what we learn from these verses is that we should always have the background in front of us. We should always know the evidence. We should always know the proof. And then before we say anything or make a decision, we would be more confident in making that decision and not feel any form of embarrassment later on. And another thing that is being mentioned here is that love for something will motivate sacrifice. What did the first verse that we studied say? It said, we cannot attain piety until we sacrifice, until we spend from what is beloved. So if we have love for something, then we will be ready to sacrifice for it. But a person values their commodity, then they'll spend on that commodity. They'll take out time for that commodity. So if deen is beloved to us, then we'll take out time for the deen. If deen is beloved to us, then we'll spend for the deen. If Allah is beloved to us and we want to make efforts for the hereafter for succeeding, then we will sacrifice for that. Luqman al-Hakim was asked the question that how much do we give time to the dunya and how much time do we give to the akhirah, to the hereafter. So Luqman al-Hakim, the wise, he responded by saying, give that much time and effort and sacrifice to the world to the extent that you are going to live here. And give that much time and sacrifice regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the akhirah for how much time you will live in the hereafter. So if we analyze ourselves, most of our energy and sacrifice and struggles is for the dunya. Like one brother was saying that if you look at all your blessings, they end at death. They end at mot. As soon as death comes, all the blessings that we have, they end. The only thing that remains with us after death is what? Your iman, your faith, and your good deeds. So we're struggling and striving for the things of this world up to before death. But if death comes to us now, how much of that will help us? It's our iman, it's our faith, and it's our good deeds that will help us. That's why even when struggling and striving for the dunya, we should take our deen there as well. So we shouldn't abandon our prayers at work. 
We shouldn't abandon the truth at work. We shouldn't abandon justice at home. We should apply all of these concepts of Islam even at home, even at work, wherever we are. Then we will see that this will all become part of our deen. It will all become part of our sacrifice and struggle for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we love something, it becomes our objective, it becomes our purpose. We're ready to sacrifice for it, we're ready to give time for it, we're ready to strive for it. So this is what we learn also from this lesson. And as I pointed out earlier, the final lesson is that truth supports truth. So if we see someone doing good, even if we're unable to do it, we should support it. Because it's truth, it's our objective. Right? It's our purpose as well. So there's many, there's many efforts of the deen, for example, going on. But just because I don't associate with a particular type of da'wah or a particular type of group or particular mission, but it's on the nahj, it's on the pattern of Allah and the Prophet it doesn't mean I speak bad about them. It doesn't mean that I raise fingers at them. SubhanAllah, they're doing great work. It supports the truth. It supports the mission. May Allah bless them and, 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 and may Allah increase them. Right? So truth should support truth. Just like we want others to support us. Like look at the example of the... Quebec law that they want to pass. They want to ban uh, the hijab, they want to ban the, the, the Sikh turban, they want to ban, in some cases, the big crosses. So, what are the protesters saying? It's not only the Muslims that are coming out, it's the Christians, it's the Sikhs, it's, it's the Jews, everyone's coming out. Why? Because they have one common theme that we don't want to lose our identity, we don't want to lose our symbols. We want to go into the public system and the public with our religious symbols. Right? So everyone is supporting each other because it's common cause. So when it comes to the truth as well, everyone needs to support each other. We need to, we need to congratulate each other. We need to acknowledge each other. We need to work together and cooperate as a human family. There are many companions. Some of them were always learning and in education. It didn't mean that they spoke bad about those who were always outside striving and struggling in campaigns, right? they supported each other. Right? Umar radiallahu anhu, he makes a mention in the narration of Sahih Bukhari, that there were days where I was away from the majlis of the Prophet ﷺ because I had to go to work. I had to take care of family. So I made a deal with another companion. And the deal was, when you are in the majlis of the Prophet ﷺ, record everything, understand everything, ask all the questions and then teach it to me. And when you're absent and I'm with the Prophet ﷺ, I will retain everything and learn everything and ask the questions and I will share it for you. And this is how they did it. So they supported each other. They worked together for the common cause. So we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us steadfast on the truth. May Allah allow us always to congratulate and, all, and work towards supporting the truth. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the success in this life and the hereafter. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وانقنا عذاب النار اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى من القول والعمل والنية والهدي والهدى إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرض المسلمين اللهم اغفر موتانا وموت المسلمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون سلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين